Hi you guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, I would love it if you guys would hit that subscribe button and definitely leave me a comment down below letting me know any cool case suggestions or just something you want to see next. So today's case is requested by KB and thank you K for this suggestion. It is wild. After just a normal night with her friends, Alison Botha drives back to her apartment. As she parks her car, she is confronted by a man with a knife. And we'll get into it, but this is the incredible story of Alison Botha. And let's get into it, and I hope I'm saying her name right, Alison Botha, Alison. So Alison Botha was born on September 22nd, 1967 in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and her parents divorced when Alison was just uh, 10 years old, and she spent, you know, majority of her childhood living with her mother and her brother. In her early years, Alison led a fairly normal life. She was the head girl in her school. She was confident and well-spoken. When she actually finished her studies, she spent a few years traveling, and after she returned home from her travels, she got a job as an insurance broker, which she really enjoyed. On December 18th, 1994, Allison, she was 27 years old at the time, and she had been spending the day at the beach with her friends. And after they went to the beach, Allison brought her friends back to her apartment to just eat some pizza, drink some drinks, and play some games. So now the night's coming to an end. Most of her friends had left, and Allison just had one friend um, left at her apartment. Her name was Kim, and Allison had offered to actually drop Kim home. So Kim and Allison, they get into Allison's car. Allison goes and drops Kim back to Kim's house. So by the time this is happening, it's around 1 a.m. So Allison, she is now returning back to her apartment after dropping her friend Kim home. So as she drives back and she's looking to park her car, she realizes that the spot that she normally parks her car in, it's now taken. So she has to go find a new parking spot. And that's kind of annoying to her because the spot that she originally had was super convenient. Like it was right outside her, you know, apartment uh, like door. So now Allison's like, damn. So she starts driving around looking for another parking spot, but looking for something that's still walking distance to her apartment. She don't want to park too far away. So as she's driving, she sees this big tree and there's a parking spot beneath it. It was big enough to block the streetlights and kind of be a pretty dark, dodgy spot, but the road was already like poorly lit, but she was like, that's the spot. So she drove into that car park. At this point, she was honestly just really tired and she was just looking forward to going inside, taking a cool shower and then, you know, getting into bed. But Allison wouldn't make it inside. After she parked her car, she reaches over into the passenger side to grab a bag of clean laundry that she wanted to take back upstairs to her apartment. And then as she was doing that, she suddenly felt like this gust of warm air. She looks over at the driver's side and she realizes a man with a knife had opened up her driver's side door. Oh my God, honestly, you guys, that is like the biggest fear of, like it's not the biggest fear of mine, but it's a fear of mine. And I, as soon as I get in the car, like daylight, nighttime, whatever, I lock my doors ASAP. Wait, wait, first I get in the car, turn around, make sure no one's in the back seat. And then I lock my doors, like lock your doors, guys. So the car door had been flung open and you know, next to her stood this like scrawny guy. He was tall with blonde hair. And that's when she noticed the knife. He says, move over or I'll kill you. Allison was obviously terrified. So she just did what he said. She moved into the passenger side seat. He gets in and is in the driver's seat and he puts his foot on the accelerator. He takes control of the car and he drives away. As they're driving this man, he introduces himself um, as Clinton. And he says, I don't want to kill you. I just want to use your car for an hour. At that point, I would have been like, well, dang, can you just let me out? Like, go use my car. Can I just, can I just go? So then when he said that, Allison was like, okay, I believe this guy. And she kind of was just like trying to keep calm the whole time. At first she thought about just jumping out of the moving car, but she found herself just frozen and she couldn't, she couldn't like decide when to do it. And she was just kind of like, she just couldn't make the decision. 
She then literally did what I said. She begged him. She's like, can you just take the car and let me go? Like, please, please just let me go. And he refused. So now when he refuses, I would be thinking like, okay, well, then clearly you don't want just the car. Like that would, I would be so afraid. He goes on to say that he had something he needed to do. Someone owed him money and it wouldn't be long. Clinton then drives them to one of like the main streets in Port Elizabeth and Clinton looks around and he spots the man that he's looking for. Clinton, whose real name later on turned out to be France de Troyes, France de Troyes, then travels further down to pick up this man he's looking for. And this man's name is Thunes Kruger. So then he tells Thunes to jump in the car and meet his new friend, Allison. The men then take Allison to a secluded spot just outside of the city. Now, the spot that they take her to, it's an entirely like deserted area. And it's actually an area that her, you know, family always warned her to stay clear of. At this point, Allison was frozen. She, as most of us would know, she knew that something really bad was about to happen to her. The crazy thing is what happens next is so gruesome, so horrific, so violent that it would remain etched in South Africa's history for decades to come. So now this part might be distressing for some, so please skip ahead if you find that it's too much to handle. And I might also have to mute some like graphic, graphic details. So at this point, they take Allison out of the car and Franz and Thunes tell Allison, okay, we're going to have sex with you. They then asked her if she would fight them. Clearly, Allison was trapped and she had no idea how to fight. So she just tells them no. Now, this part I find pretty interesting and I think it's important to share. Um, when she was being raped, Allison outlines how her body responded to the she states that as it was happening and to guard against the pain, her body involuntarily reacted to the rape and was aroused by it. And when I was doing some further research into this, it stated that many rape victims actually like they they note that they their bodies respond this way to this violent act, but nobody really speaks about it because they would get like endless amounts of shame, you know, put onto them. They're already a victim, but most likely they would be treated even worse, you know? And Alison states that she also might've just glossed over this fact had it not have been, um, like not coerced out of her, but encouraged out of her. She states that when she was detailing her story, she was so nervous and embarrassed of the fact that she most likely would have just skipped over this part but it was her co-writer who actually made her realize how important it was to actually outline and, and make this statement in her book. And up to date, she has lost count of the number of women who have come up to her and, and thanked her for actually sharing that, that aspect. So now these two men, at this point, they had both raped her. And now they were deciding, let's kill her. At first, they tried to suffocate her. She loses consciousness. But even though she passed out, she was holding on to her life. After they suffocated her and they could see that she was still like hanging on, Franz and Thunes got really frustrated. They then took their brutality to the complete next level and they began stabbing her and ended up stabbing her over 30 times. And all of these like stab wounds were all in the same spot in her abdomen. It's just, ugh, it was like the same spot. Then Allison recalls that she hears um, one of the men say that they want to mutilate her reproductive organs. What? Who the hell thinks of that? Like, I, I don't understand these men. If you want to kill her, you commit this horrible crime. You want to get rid of the evidence, you know, witnesses. I get that. Not that it's right, but I understand that process. But I've heard multiple accounts of these attackers wanting to specifically destroy a woman's 
genitals or reproductive organs. I mean, we've talked about it in previous cases and that's what I don't understand. You want to use the woman for those parts, right? And then you want to destroy it. Like that's some sick, twisted shit. Alison was only 27 years old. She was still in the prime of her reproductive years. Like why take that away from someone? So they said they wanted to do this, but somehow by the grace of God, they missed her actual like reproductive organs. So anyway, after they stab her like these multiple times, they think, okay, well, she's, she's done for it. Like she has to be done. Right. So they begin to, you know, walk away. And then unfortunately, Alison's leg twitches. And because of this twitch, Franz and Thunes decide, okay, well, we haven't done a good enough job yet. We need to do more. We need to actually finish her off. So then they take this knife. Oh my God. And then they decide to slit her throat, not once, not twice, but over 16 times. They might have just left Alison alone had her legs not twitched. Alison recalls that all she could see was an arm like moving back and forth, left and right, left and right in front of her face. And she says that the movements were making this sound like a wet sound, the sound of sloshing and the sound of her flesh being slashed open. Oh, and that's when she realized that he was cutting her throat over and over and over again. Oh my God. Like, can you imagine? I don't even know how she didn't pass out again and again from that alone, the thought alone. That alone is brave to me, like to even, to, to not like just pass out from the realization of what's even happening to you. Like that alone is commendable. So Alison remembers that as, you know, they do that to her, the men step back, like almost as if they're admiring their work and they start speaking in Afrikaans to each other. And they say to each other, like, do you think she, do you think she's dead? And then the other one will say like, oh no, yeah, she's for sure dead. Like there's no one that can survive that. Like the sickness these men would have needed to have in their head to be able to do that to someone who literally has done nothing to you is mind blowing. I mean, even if someone did something to you, you, you know, you'd hope you wouldn't resort to friggin' what they did to her. But it's clearly like, I always wonder like what it takes for someone to do that. And it seems like this, it took them nothing. She didn't do anything. She didn't even fight back. And I feel like the fact that they still did it to her, even knowing that she was like complying is, is, is so cruel. So at this point after, you know, admiring their work and they're like now satisfied that, okay, we've killed this woman, they leave her there and then they go drive off in her car. They just left her for dead, possibly just moving on to their next victim. But little did they know, Alison was still breathing. Unbelievably, Alison had survived the attack at this point still. So now at this point, Alison's lying, you know, on this sand on top of like broken glass. And she finally regains consciousness and she starts thinking like, if I'm going to die, I have to leave a clue here as to who did this to me. So she decided to use her fingers and write the names of her attackers in the dirt. So she writes France and Thunes. And then beneath that, she wrote, I love you, mom, which makes me like so emotional. Cause like, even in this state of despair and like, like, I don't even know what she was thinking at this point, you know? And she's, you know, you always want your mom, you know, like that's, that's at 27 years old, she still wanted her mom. But as she's doing this, Alison thinks like, well, okay, maybe I can survive this. She looks forward and in the distance she can see headlights. So she realizes she's on a, you know, near a main road. And she thinks if I can just sort of make my way to the road, maybe someone can help me. So as she starts moving towards the road, that's when she realizes the real extent of her injuries. She kind of moves and then her head falls backwards. She was nearly decapitated. Like, I don't even understand, like, uh, 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 like, can you imagine that happening to you and your head like falls back onto your back? I think I would have died just from that, like realization of what's happening to me, like for real. Then on top of that, she can feel like something slimy, like protruding from her abdomen. So she looks down and she like, like looks to see what it is. It was her intestines like falling out of her. She had been stabbed and mutilated so bad that her body couldn't even hold it together. 
So she used one hand, you know, on her abdomen to hold her organs inside her body. And she found like a denim shirt at the scene that she like wrapped it up and held it against her. And she says, it's time to move. So she started like crawling through that sand and broken glass and stuff, like crawling her way through, struggling, you know, to get to the road through the dirt and holding one hand on her wounds, like crawling would have been really difficult. So as she keeps crawling, she goes, which with each like move and pull, she gets even more exhausted. I mean, she's got blood loss. She's tired. She's in shock. She's probably got adrenaline too. So it's like all these kinds of like mixes of things. So then she ends up collapsing onto the sand because she's so exhausted. Then she was like, okay, crawling is proving to be way too slow. I need to get my ass up and walk. I don't even know how she did that. And that alone to me is like, dang, you know? That alone is determination. So she stands up. As she stands up, her head falls back onto her back. So she had to walk with one hand on her intestines, holding her organs in, and then one hand on her head, like holding her head up. She said her vision was going super blurry in and out. So as she like held her head up and like connected everything again, her vision like temporarily returned. And she states at that point, her, you know, sight kept fading in and out and in and out, but it returned enough for her to like make it to the road. So she finally reaches the road and then she collapses on the white dotted lines marking the road. And even in her like disoriented state, she was like, this is probably the best position for me to be laying in because she was half on the road to like attract the attention of a like passing motorist and fortunately for Allison she didn't have to wait too long a young vet student named Tian Eilard was passing by and he stopped for Allison he was actually visiting Port Elizabeth from Johannesburg and he saw her laying on the ground and he decided to stop and help her and Tian later states that God put him on that road that night for one reason only and you know we always think about Um, like we always talk about these, like people who help people on the, you know, victims and things like that. But do you guys think that you would have stopped? Like if you saw a woman laying on the road, especially in an area that was, you know, known for its crime and violence, would you, would you get out of your vehicle? I'm always curious what you guys think. Like, I feel like if I'm being honest, if I had my kid in the car, I probably wouldn't get out of the car. I probably would stop the car, call the police, but I, I'm, And I know that probably sounds really bad, but I don't know if I would actually get out because now I'm putting my child in danger if something happens to me, you know, but this guy was really brave considering he was young and he was on a vacation, you know, so amazing that he did that. So he used his veterinary training to tuck Allison's thyroid like organ back into her neck. He called, you know, the paramedics and he kept her conscious while uh, waiting for the paramedics to arrive. So Allison was then rushed to hospital. And when she arrived, the doctors and the nurses, they were just stunned by her condition. Allison's injuries were nothing like doctors had ever seen before. One doctor said that he had never seen such severe injuries and he had been working in the field for like 16 years. Allison at this point was on the brink of death, but somehow she managed to pull through. And on top of that, she remembered everything about her attack and her attackers. Alice's surgery lasted three hours and after three weeks in the hospital, she was released. Doctors state that um, Allison survived because none of the 54 like stabs and cuts and things like that nicked one of her main arteries. Therefore, she didn't bleed to death and she could keep breathing even through her severed um, trachea, which is mind blowing considering her head was literally hanging off her shoulders. I mean, the body and mind can be such powerful healers. Like you just need to have that will, you know, the will to survive. Soon after, Allison was able to help the police and identify her attackers through police pictures. And she did this while she was still in hospital. This led to the speedy arrest of the Ripper rapists as they were known through the media. So the trial that began just captured the attention of South Africans everywhere. And both Franz and Thunes pleaded guilty to eight charges and they included kidnapping, rape and attempted murder. Thunes and Franz then claimed that they identified as satanists and they enacted ritual abuse and that's just what they were doing that night I guess. Allison would later say that Satan really tried to steal her life. Franz and Thunes were both found guilty and were sentenced to life in prison 
in August of 1995. The judge in this case stated that he wanted to make it clear that he believed, sorry, <laughs> the judge in this case stated that he wanted to make it clear that he believed that these men were incredibly violent and that they should never, ever, ever be released from jail. But unfortunately, all prisoners that were sentenced to life in prison before October 2004 um, are eligible for parole, which really, 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 really sucks for Allison. Because, I mean, even with all her strength, like knowing that the men that did this to you have a chance at a free life and a chance to come back and hurt you again is terrifying. And get this, Franz actually contacted Allison from prison and he was asking her for a letter of forgiveness but then also asking her for some of the profits from her book. Alison quickly declined that offer. There was actually also a movie made about this and Alison hopes that the film portrays the need, well, the need to protect victims. She states that she wasn't approached when Franz and Thurns became eligible for parole and I think that's kind of messed up kind of messed up it's hella messed up she said she was not approached or guided at all and she has connections and the know-how on you know how to find out and how to try and change it but what about all the other victims where do they even know where to begin and how would they even continue living knowing that their attackers you know would come out and could possibly come out on parole and i mean that's kind of messed up i understand the laws but given the severity of her attack shouldn't she have at least been warned or like informed about the fact that they, okay, now these guys who did this to you are eligible for parole. Like they could be released. Like that's, that's insane to me. But even though the worst was behind her, Alison still, you know, dealt with severe emotional and physical scars. She struggled with serious depression following her attack and could not hold a job down. She knew this event had changed her forever and she didn't know how to move forward. Like, how do you move forward with your life? Even knowing that you survived this, you can literally go into a big depression going, why me? Why me? Why did this happen to me? Why did they choose me? So in order to recover, she believed that she needed to face what happened to her. So Allison then decides to ditch her career as an insurance broker and begins traveling around the world again. And she told her story in at least 35 different countries. She was one of the first women in South Africa to speak about rape, at least publicly, and that was in her home country and abroad. And she helped other survivors come forward to share their stories. And her purpose is to spread hope through her survival story. She states that the attack somehow then put her on a path to travel around the world and help other people, inspire other people and believe that on the night of her attack that she could survive this and she was gonna make it. And she states that that belief that she had is also a great life achievement for her because it's almost like a miracle for her. She says that the, you know, all the people that reach out to her and, and tell her that she inspired them and things like that is what makes all of it worth it for her. In 1995, Alison won the prestigious Rotarian Paul Harris Award for Courage Beyond the Norm and Feminine Magazine's Women of Courage Award. She was also honored as Port Elizabeth's Citizen of the Year. Since then, Alison has written two books. In 2016, a movie was made about her and today she's considered one of the most inspiring motivational speakers in the world. Alison and her husband, Tierney, I think it is, Botha, um, and her were friends for years before they began dating. And they connected actually a year after her attack when they bonded over their like mutual shared depression. Tierney's depression resulted from unresolved childhood trauma. And Allison states that their mutual depression and their friendship sort of helped each other get out of this dark hole. It was almost very natural for them to just discuss everything and make each other feel better knowing that they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together. Alison and Tini wed in February 1997. So what's that like three years after the attack? But for Alison, the greatest gift of all was the birth of her two children because prior to this, it was unclear whether Alison would have, you know, children if she would be able to, given the extent of her injuries apparently that her female organs endured. During her attack, Franz had specifically said that he wanted to destroy her reproductive system and that was his intention. And that's something that is a bit confusing because I read somewhere that it said they didn't really destroy it, but I think what they mean by that is they did attack her. They wanted to destroy her reproductive genitalia and they tried to, but I think the fact that she had children, it's stating that clearly they didn't. But for years, she didn't know if she would be able to un until she started trying for kids, right? You never know until you start trying. You don't know. I mean, like one stab near fallopian tube, 
one scar on there. How do you know if you're even going to be able to produce an egg or let alone fertilize an egg, you know, which is what makes the news of her having children so positive to her. So in 2003, nine years after her attack took place, she gave birth to her first son called Daniel. And then three years later in 2006, she had a second baby boy named Matthew. She said that being a mother is the most incredible thing she's ever done in her life, as most moms will say. And that to know that her life is now all about someone else, it's actually a really humbling experience. Today, her story stands as an example of like human depravity, but also like the strength of our spirits. She said that life can sometimes make us feel like we're a victim, that problems and hardships and traumas that we all experience, like they just get handed out for free. You know, we all have so many issues that we have to deal with. And sometimes it seems so unfair, you know, like why me? Why is this happening to me? Like you look over there and you're like, that person has like a freaking normal, you know, no issues. And why am I here with all these freaking problems? Like you can feel like such a victim. And I understand that it's not easy to just be like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to move on. Like it's, these things happen to people and sometimes they happen Well, most of the time. I feel like they always happen to good people, but especially, but I found this case especially inspiring because I definitely feel like that sometimes, like, you know, I feel like we all do, but when you're the one feeling that way, you just don't realize that, hey, other people are going through stuff too, because you're so focused on all the bad things that happened to you. So there was this quote that Alison said that I wanted to read to you guys that I found pretty inspiring. She states, remind yourself that you do not have to take responsibility for what others do. Life is not a collection of what happens to you, but of how you've responded to what has happened to you. Think about that. So thank you so much, Kay, for bringing this case to my attention. I'm sure I've missed some parts. If I, if I have, definitely leave them in the comments down below. This was all the information I could kind of find. But her strength and ability to move on is so incredible that I thought I have to make a video on this. I mean, even recovering from depression to go and speak up and fight for others is so inspiring. I mean, days that I'm struggling, I have to remember that there are other people battling much deeper struggles than I am. And not that it minimizes what I'm going through, but we can all make it through. You know, we just got to be positive about things. I hope this case inspires you guys too. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments down below. And thank you so much for watching and for all your support. And I'm about to give you some, this is more orange red besitos. So besitos. Mwah. See you next time.